On this cold, wintry morning, we begin our worship in the name of our triune God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sin, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, to call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness. Confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together, as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I would encourage you then to bow your heads, to close your eyes, to think about, to remember your sins, as we then confess them to our God. Give us our sins and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. 
Our first reading is from Isaiah chapter 40. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings, pe- he brings princes to naught and reduces rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they t- take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither, and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One. Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Yet when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, for I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge, and so not make use of my rights in preaching it. Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all men so that all, by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified from the prize. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, Lord. As soon as Jesus and his disciples left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak, because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up. He left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. When they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. And so he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We respond having heard those words of Jesus. As we confess our faith, this morning we use the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
Well, my friends, I'm Pastor Joel. I'd like to welcome you in the name of the Lord and ask only that the God who can do immeasurably more than we could ever imagine or fathom, that he would guard your hearts to stay and keep your minds and your lives fixed on Jesus, both today and every day. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen, Amen indeed. Well, guys, today I want to talk about crisis. And the way that it comes into our lives and what we do about it. There was a crisis that was happening in our gospel text, and I kind of want to spend some time unpacking it. No, I don't want to focus today on, on Jesus and what he was doing in terms of going off to pray with his father. Instead, we're going to be focusing on Jesus and his interactions with his people, his disciples, and their families. But first, I want to ask you if you've ever heard the story about this guy, Ernest Hemingway. There's a, there's a story about him that I think is neat. Now, you may have read some of his books. He's a famous American author, wrote a lot of classics, all right? But uh, there's this story that one time he was uh, sitting at a writer's table in a, in a restaurant or a coffee shop or, or somewhere up in Algonquin. And there were like a bunch of other writers around. And, and some of the other writers, they were all complaining, you know, how hard it is to write a short story. You know, because you just don't have the space to develop the characters or, or the plot. And they said, you know, it's almost impossible to write a compelling short story. The shorter it is, the, the less effective or the less powerful the story. And Hemingway said, that's not true. And they said, yeah, well, let, 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 let's have a little wager about this. And so the, the story goes that Hemingway said, all right, I bet you I can write a compelling story in six words. And so they all bet 10 bucks on it. They threw their money into the pot. Hemingway grabbed a napkin and he scribbled these words on it. For sale, baby shoes, never worn. Now, some of you probably heard that and you went, oh, right? But doesn't that story just beg for more information? I mean, six little words. And it's got a beginning, a middle, and an end, right? But at the same time, it just... It just captivates you. It sucks you in. It leaves you wondering and asking questions like, like, did the baby die? Is that why the baby shoes were never worn? Or, or, or did the, was there an accident and the whole family died? And now, now like a relative is cleaning out the house and they found baby shoes that were never worn? Or, or, or is this just a normal case where, you know, parents, like every parent here, sometimes buys shoes or clothes that their kids grow out of before they even have a chance to wear them? And now this is a garage sale ad in the summer for sale. Baby shoes never worn. Is the baby fine? Is the baby not fine? We don't know. And so, in the story, the author said, Hemingway, you win. <laughs> And he won the pot. He won the bet. Yep. Sometimes it's just a few short words that mean so much. And isn't that a lot like life? I mean, sometimes it doesn't take much more than a few short words to leave us with all sorts of questions about what's going on in our life. And when that happens, oftentimes we find ourselves spiraling into a crisis. And sometimes the phrases which send us into that tailspin aren't even six words. Sometimes it only takes three or less. Like, like imagine if the police show up at your door and they say an accident happened. Three words. Crisis. Or imagine, or imagine if the police come home to your house and they've got your son in handcuffs and they say... We found drugs. Crisis. Or imagine if it's a phone call from the police and they call about your daughter. She's driving drunk. Crisis. Or what if it's, what if it's your marriage that's in trouble? And, and after an argument, your spouse says the words that spend, send you into a crisis. Three little words. I hate you. Leave me alone. Or maybe this one. I'm leaving you. Three little words. Crisis. Or maybe an aging parent with dementia. 
And maybe they're the ones asking the questions to you. And, and maybe it's just those short little phrases, which mean so much. Like when an aging parent with dementia says, Who are you? Or where am I? Crisis. Crisis. It doesn't take much but it often means a lot. And it leaves us with so many questions. Just like the story of the baby shoes, we're often left with more questions than answers. And the way that we feel in the midst of a crisis, it's, it's insanely complicated. Like, like, at first, when the crisis happens, you end up just numb with shock. Like, it seems very surreal. Like, this can't be happening. And then... And then the numbness can wear off and you're left with anger. You know, you can feel responsible and you can feel guilty over the circumstances, depending on what might or might not have happened. But like your mind keeps racing. It's so hard to turn it off. And, and even though you're not physically active, you're mentally weary and it's exhausting physically. You end up feeling very, very fatigued, right? You know that. And even though you're physically drained, your mind can't shut off, and so you don't sleep. You end up almost with an insomnia, right? And you just keep turning it over and over, replaying it over and over. And that, that replaying it, the more you think it, it, the more confusing it gets. How could this have happened? Why me? We have all these questions, and so we worry incessantly and endlessly and and when we do get the blessing of sleep, it's often not that blessed. Oftentimes we're plagued with nightmares, and even in our dreams, we're haunted by the crisis of our waking moments. And, and, and we don't want to talk about it. Friends reach out, and they say, how are you doing? Three little words. They're trying to be there for you, but every time they open up that door, it just forces you to, to face the crisis that you're trying to escape from. And so sometimes it's easier just to run away. And so sometimes we, we withdraw socially. And no, that's not the best way to handle a crisis. But there can be aggression and a whole lot of tears and a whole lot of crying. So now there was a crisis in our Bible text for today. You might have missed it because it doesn't give a whole lot of detail, but it points out the reality of the crisis in a very clear and poignant way. Maybe you missed it. Maybe you never thought about it. Maybe you read these words before and just moved right on past them. But, but here was the crisis. From Mark chapter 1. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. This is Simon Peter, Jesus' disciple, Peter, one of the twelve. I bet you didn't even realize Peter was married. Some of you didn't even know that. Yeah, Peter was married. He had a wife, probably had kids too, and, and he followed Jesus. And, and, and so his mother-in-law, probably living with him and his brother Andrew, kind of a big family compound. But, but imagine the situation here, Right? Like, we may not get a lot of details about what was going on. Like, we know Simon Peter's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, but we don't even know her name. How sick was she? How long was she sick? I, I do wish this text gave us more details. I do wish it unpacked more. But the truth is, we don't necessarily need more. The details don't change the essence of the crisis, right? Someone they loved was sick. Right? And, and maybe the point why this is in the Bible isn't to give us the details, but to instead teach us something about how God responds in the midst of our crisis. And, and maybe we don't need to know the details of the crisis because, you know, for each and every one of us, we've all been in our own crises, and we know what those feel like, right? So we can probably guess what Peter and his wife were feeling too, right? So just imagine, you know, Peter had been out with his brother and the other disciples all day with Jesus. And they'd seen the miracles. They'd heard the teaching. They were with Jesus. And so Peter comes home to his wife, to his family, and he's excited. He's like, honey, I got to tell you. And then he sees her face. 
And instantly, he knows something is wrong. Right? Crisis. And maybe she was the one who told him just the three little words. Maybe she said, my mom's sick. Or, or perhaps she said, it's a fever. Or maybe she even said, Peter, she's dying. She's scared, afraid, crisis. Yes, the threat of looming death is a scary thing, and it is indeed a crisis. It's not the only crisis we could face. I mean, jobs get lost, kids get in trouble. Identity theft is out there. I mean, if you've ever been victimized by identity theft, it puts you in a crisis, leaves you feeling exposed and vulnerable. Or your car breaks down on the side of the road, and you don't know where to go, or who to call, or what to do. Or your bank account's too low, and there's too much month left, and not enough money. Crisis. So, what do we do? Peter was in a crisis. What did they do? Here's the very next part of that verse. They told Jesus about her. They told Jesus about her. They, they went to Jesus with their crisis. It seems like such a simple thing, but, but don't underestimate its significance or importance of going to Jesus with what we're dealing with first. That was the first thing they did. They told Jesus about her. And, and, and don't also ignore the fact that Jesus was there. That is not an insignificant detail, right? Jesus was there for them. And you know what? He's there for you, too. Don't ignore that fact. Jesus was the one who promised that he would be with you always to the very end of the age. He was the one who declared that he will never leave us, nor will he forsake us. Jesus is there so what do we do when we find ourselves in a crisis? Doesn't matter what it is. We tell Jesus about it. We tell Jesus about it. And in Christ's life and in his death and in his ministry, in what he did on the cross, we see that he has power to save, right? Jesus suffered and died for the sins of the world. And at first glance, that might seem like a loss, right? Because he died. But you can't also tell the story of Christ saving us without also sharing that he rose. Which means he conquered death. He's stronger than sin. He has overcome this world. And so when we find ourselves beaten down by the crises of life and the troubles that do come into our lives, what do we do? We go to the one who has overcome. We go to the one who is stronger than this world. And he is with us. What does he say? He says, I'm here. I won't leave you. I love you. Don't be afraid. Just like it does, doesn't take much more than a short little phrase to send us into a crisis, to remind us that we are not alone. Jesus speaks words of comfort to us as well. I'm here. I won't leave you. I love you. Don't be afraid. Three little words. You know, in the Bible, the phrase, don't be afraid or, or fear not, occurs 365 times. It's like there's one phrase for each and every day of the year. God's trying to remind us each and every day, don't be afraid. I love you. I'm here. I won't leave you. Now, in the story with Peter's mother-in-law, Jesus walked up to her bedside, lifted her up, and healed her. He miraculously chose to act in that moment. Praise God. And sometimes he still does that. But he always helps in his own way, right? I can't tell you how the crises that we face will resolve themselves because they're all different. Every crisis is different, and so the resolution is different. It's not like a one-stop shop for, for how we solve and fix our problems. But instead, the first step we do know in the solution is to go to Jesus, and we invite him in. Sometimes that resolution is something we have to walk through with some time. Or, or sometimes we need to get other help. Sometimes it takes counseling or legal advice. But the resources that God brings into our lives as he walks through it with us still come from his hand. And like I said, whether it's a quick resolution or whether it's something that takes some time, I don't know how God's going to get us through it, but I do know this. He will. He will. And so the key for our crises, for yours and mine, 
Turn in faith to Jesus. And you know what he's going to say? I'm here. I won't leave you. I love you. Don't be afraid. Amen. And now may the peace of God that goes beyond everything that we could ever imagine or fathom, may God's peace guard your hearts and your minds and keep your eyes fixed on Jesus Christ from this day forward to life everlasting. Amen. We rise for prayer.
please keep distance for the sake of some who are very concerned about that. And in the narthex, be respectful of those receiving communion as you walk out. We continue now with our closing hymn.